So we're back with our, our second take on our different approaches to leadership today. Yes, part two. Let's see, should we start by recapping what we discussed last time? I think that's smart, uh, kind of laid the groundwork of where we've been. I think last time when we were discussing, we said that there's no consensus on the definition of a leader or what constitutes effectual leadership. Uh, there are about as many definitions of leadership as there are people who write about it. And keep in mind, there are about 1,500 people who research leadership every day. And I think we came to the understanding that leadership is an influence dyad between a leader and a follower, and that that dyad is based off of a power disparity in the relationship. I think we also discussed the six forms of power, and without power, there is no influence. So in order to be influential, we have to have some sort of power source. And we did discuss the principle of equifinality. I remember it well. That there's more than one way to skin a cat, and leadership is subject to that principle. And that leaders are people. And leadership is a process or relationship, whichever way you prefer. And that leadership isn't people and people aren't leadership. People are leaders. And what are we going to discuss today? Well, we're going to cover, I think, three of the 10 leadership approaches uh, that we discussed along our continuum last time. We're going to start at the low end uh, down there where charisma and maturity uh, are not as important. So we're going to start kind of down there. We're going to discuss laissez-faire leadership a little bit more in depth. We discussed it a little bit last time, but we're going to kind of do a dive into it okay? and kind of come to some conclusions about what laissez-faire leadership is. Now, we talk about laissez-faire being at the low end of the spectrum. You say it has to do with low end as far as maturity or charisma required. But I remember specifically going back to the full range leadership theory by Bruce Avolio and Bernie Bass. And, and they did specifically cite effectiveness. So I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Is he right that it, it's a less effective form of leadership? Yeah, and we're going to discuss it here as part of uh, laissez-faire, uh, along with some attribute approaches and some behavioral approaches. So those are the three we're going to cover today. So I think if we, let's jump back into laissez-faire because we discussed it last time. Laissez-faire, if we translate it, is French for letting things happen. It's a hands-off philosophy to leadership. Sounds like it could be a good thing. Well, it could be, except that you got to remember laissez-faire started in the economics arena. Uh, we talked a little bit last time about Kurt Lewin. Yes. He of the thaw, change, refreeze model. Lewin was the first one that articulated laissez-faire leadership back in the 1930s. And this he really adapted it from the economic environment to where the economic environment was really looking for hands-off philosophy to government regulation. So he adapted it from the economics arena. Laissez-faire is often referred to as hollow leadership, and the reason that it is is because gov- the leaders, when they use laissez-faire leadership, abstain from guidance, oversight, and follower development, hence the reason they let things happen. They let them take their own course. So laissez-faire leaders, they don't employ authority. They usually don't provide a lot of guidance. They forego control, and they embrace ideations that followers are going to excel if you'll just leave them alone. Again, that's where we get this French for letting things happen. If I'm hands off and just let it happen, that's what they consider a, an approach to leadership. There are a lot of people who basically are trying to rehabilitate laissez-faire leadership and show it in a positive light, and they point to it as being delegative, which it is, hands off, which it is, and preserving follower freedom of action, which it does. However, the moment you suggest something or the minute you check a status or provide some guidance, or discuss a follower's development, you're no longer just letting things happen. You're now involved in influence. Okay. Okay, so it runs contrary to the idea that leadership is influence uh, by simply letting things happen. In a, not, in a negative light, most people believe laissez-faire to be an abdication of responsibility. Uh, I heard a coworker say the other day, the laissez-faire leader is the person that goes in the office and shuts their door. Mm-hmm. And the minute that there's an important meeting, they decide they've got to go to a medical appointment and that it will just happen. Right. French for letting things happen. There's been a lot of research into laissez-faire leadership, and it's generally considered leadership's weakest influence form because it's grounded in non-interference and it outsources decision-making to followers. It's about letting things happen. And there's been a lot of investigations of laissez-faire leadership over the course of time. You would think articulated in the 1930s, it's been subjected to to a number or numerous analyses or meta-analyses. It's pretty well conclusive. The evidence is pretty conclusive that laissez-faire leaders 
sh- suffer from influence shortcomings, followers aren't as productive, and there's efficacy issues associated with their leadership. Mm-hmm. So often it's called non-transactional. And so it's, but it's shown strong negative correlations with almost all influence related benchmarks. Okay. Now transitioning now to the next theory we're going to discuss. Right. Which is going to be, we're starting to get into the trait and attribute theories. Right. When you get into trait and attribute approaches, we need to think back to the genesis, which is really tied to some of the great man theories. Okay. All right. The great man theories presuppose that characteristics or traits or attributes were different for leaders than they were for non-leaders. And under attribute theories, leader qualities set them apart from other people who are non-leaders. Right. Or poor leaders. This is this whole mindset of leaders being born, not made. Right. Right. And, absolutely. And for the longest time, that's that's really what people thought, that you, you either had it or you didn't. You were born a leader or you weren't. That it wasn't something that could be learned or developed, which we found out actually fairly recently in time, probably within the last hundred years, within the last century, that that isn't true. Yeah. And, and we've come to the understanding that leaders can be effective in numerous ways. The one, the thing you'll want to do as a leader is play to your natural strengths and not try to be something that you're not. And therein lies an inherent problem with attribute and trait and characteristic theories is they try to articulate a set of attributes or characteristics. And right now, the scholarly leadership community can't come to an agreement as to which characteristics or which attributes or which traits constitute effectual leadership. And I'd argue that's probably situational. So depending on who the followers are, what the situation is, Certain things that might be effective in other situations may be less effective in others and vice versa. Yeah, it could be very much so. You know, we tend to exhibit different characteristics based off of different environmental factors. So certainly. I think it's important for us when we look at traits and attributes uh, and characteristics to define what those terms actually mean. Okay, a trait is a routinized behavioral consistency. Okay, so when we say he has the trait of of being courageous... All right, we are demonstrating courage over an extended period of time. It's a routinized behavioral consistency. A characteristic is a specific feature or distinguishing quality or property. Okay, something that makes you or distinguishes you is a characteristic. Attributes are a little bit different. Normally, when we talk about attributes, we're talking about a positive characteristic. Mm-hmm. Like it's, a virtue. Sure. It's a personal identifier Okay, that's unique to a person. So when we talk about an attribute, we're talking about the unique attributes that set someone apart. ADRP 622 doesn't define an attribute for us. It simply says an attribute is what a leader is. Are there some specific um, theories around these traits and attributes you'd like to discuss? Yeah, and I think the, the thing that we, as we start to look at the trait and attribute approaches to leadership, it's important to know that this thing that we've articulated characteristics and attribute theory since the 1930s. A lot of studies have gone into trait and attribute theories mm-hmm. when it comes to leadership. And almost all of them come back to four broad categories that traits fit in. And that's personal abilities. What is it you can do? You know, what are you good at? What are you not good at? Your intrapersonal skills, how well you relate to others. Your controlling aptitudes, how well are you or how, how good do you do at being in charge? And your influence capabilities. 622, ADRP 622 is a little bit different. It says that there are three attributes a leader is supposed to have, and those are character, presence, and intellect. Character defined as the identity of a leader. Presence is how the leader is perceived, specifically among followers. And then their intellect, the mental and social faculties a leader has. But like I said, now there's no consensus amongst leadership scholars. Now think about it this way. There are 1,500 leadership scholars who research the topic every day. They can't come to a conclusive definition of what leadership is. Right. Okay. They can't come to an agreement either as to what set of attributes, characteristics, or traits an effectual leader is supposed to have. If I wanted to develop a little bit more self-awareness and what my strengths and weaknesses are when it comes to these traits, these attributes, is there an instrument I can take? I I heard of a lot of them, a lot of personality instruments. Is there one that I can take that can accurately... Is the one that can better inform me as to what my strengths might be? And with that said, too, are these kind of tied to our DNA, what we're born with, or are behaviors always a choice? Is it different than behaviors? Do I look at traits as something perhaps I'm born with? Regardless of that, though, uh, I can always choose to, to alter my behaviors. 
Well, certainly. We're, now, remember, we're staying with the traits and the attributes. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to traits and attributes, there's two different schools of thought. One school of thought says this is the set of traits or attributes you're born with. The other is, is that you can learn specific attributes or traits or develop them, such as like a muscle. Okay, so, you know, you want to have big biceps, you go to the gym, lift a bunch of weights. Right. Okay, you're born with the characteristic of, I have the potential to develop, you know, this muscle or this this attribute. Right. Now, probably the best, if I was going to guide you down the road toward an attribute theory or an attribute approach, I would probably say that the five-factor model, which was developed in 1961 by Ernest Tupis and Raymond Crystal, is probably the most mature and well-developed a trait and attribute theory when it comes to leadership characteristics. Okay, so the five factor model, we'll get into that in a minute. And that you can either use the acronym OCEAN or CANOE. I think we'll probably use OCEAN today. And that is the only psychometrically valid personality instrument that I believe the APA uses. Uh, the other instruments out there aren't the ones that are rooted in the science. They don't have the the depth of the statistical conclusions that that the five-factor model has. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, the five-factor model is developed in 1961. It's got almost six decades of psychometric history behind it. What you find is, is regardless of how you want to characterize the five attributes or characteristics, almost all the research comes back and points at those five in some form or fashion. Even though it's been subjected to, there's literally mountains of research data on the five-factor model. Right. And almost all of them return to the original five factors as articulated by Tupas and Crystal. So over history, it seems to be the one that has the, the deepest psychometric history behind it. Let's talk about that OCEAN acronym then. So it stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Right. right. Okay. Let, let's start with the first one then, openness. What, what is openness? All right. If, you, if you're looking for a definition of it, it kind of describes a person's depth and breadth of their intellectual curiosity and their preference for novelty and variety. Okay. All right. How willing are you to try new things? How willing are you to be open to new experiences? Now, remember, when we get to the five-factor model, each one of the factors kind of has a negative face and it also has a dark side. Right. When we're talking about openness, if we said... If we said it has what its good face is or what its, what the, its face of high openness is, it's people who tend to dream big and pursue self-actualization. Okay, they're open to new experiences. People who are said to have low openness tend to be hard-headed and are very rigid. Is having a high level of openness more conducive to being an influential person, a better leader? Well, I think if we're going to talk about lifelong learning as something, as an attribute of a, an effective leader, I don't necessarily know that you can be a lifelong learner and have low openness. I think the two have you have to have high openness, I think, in order to be a lifelong learner. And that's openness to new ideas, new experiences, new knowledge, new knowledge. Okay. Right. Right. And there think about these things. Think about these five attributes as like golden mean virtues. Okay? And in the middle we kind of have the virtue and on one end we have the high openness and on the or the high piece of that uh, of that attribute and on the other side we have the low side of it. So like conscientiousness is the same way. You know, if we have high conscientiousness, we have people who tend to be workaholics or perfectionists. And then if we have low conscientiousness, we kind of have people who are irresponsible and really don't care much. So that's kind of the second piece of it is conscientiousness. So people that indicate a high level of conscientiousness will typically appear to be better organized, make their beds in the morning, their desk work area tends to be clean versus low conscientiousness seem to be a little less organized and uh, scatterbrained, maybe not as punctual. Yeah, and conscientiousness, conscientiousness over time has been, the, the definition has been evolving, but it, what's kind of been pinned down over the last 30 years or so is that people who are organized, as you mentioned, dependable, disciplined, and prefer planned behavior. Okay. Okay, people who are low in conscientiousness uh, tend to be a little more disorganized, a little less dependable. Uh, not as disciplined and more spontaneous. So is there a certain side of the spectrum that might lend itself to somebody being more influential when it comes to conscientiousness? Yeah, and we'll kind of talk about that at the end okay. because out of the five factors uh, that the five-factor model holds, four of them have been strongly and positively correlated with effectual leadership. Okay. One of them has a negative correlation to leadership, but we'll, let's save that for the end, and we'll kind of tell you which ones were and which ones weren't. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the next one. Extroversion. Extroversion. Right, as most people would think, that, that, you know, the opposite of introversion. 
So extroversion kind of describes the degree in which people thrive in social contexts or they're energetic or assertive. Right. And again, these traits, these indicate our preferences, but not necessarily how they're expressed in behavior. Well, they're traits. And we said, you know, a trait is a routinized behavioral tendency. Okay. Okay. So don't think in terms of MBTI. Okay. Myers-Briggs. Think more in terms of a routinized behavioral tendency. Okay. Your behavior would tend to point as you toward you as being extroverted or your behavior would be interpreted as introverted. For example, if you're highly extroverted, people might view you as being attention seeking or domineering. Okay, if you suffer or you don't have, you have low extroversion or introversion, uh, people think you're aloof or detached or self-absorbed. Okay. So it's really manifesting itself in observable behaviors, traits. But I'd argue that we always have choice when it comes to our behaviors, that we have control over that. We, our behaviors aren't predetermined. For instance, if I give you an example, um, Oprah Winfrey, somebody who's very influential, one might guess from her behaviors and what we see on TV that she would be high on the extroversion spectrum when actually she identifies as, as an introvert. What are your thoughts on that then? So versus what somebody, somebody is predisposed to be, but versus how those behaviors are expressed. Right. And I think a lot of it has to do with the perception of the follower in relation to the leader in this influence dyad that we talked about. I may perceive you to be introverted. However, you may be extroverted. Okay. Okay. And it has to do with the perception between the leader and the follower in this dyad that we're, we, we were talking about in terms of the leader follower dyad. So what matters more than who we are or how we're perceived? Well, I think it, uh, authentic leadership would tell you it's a matter of who you are. Okay. However, a lot of times it, your influence and the amount of influence that you have is driven by how you're perceived by your followers. Self-awareness is probably going to encompass both then who we are, what our tendencies are, but also a big component of that is how we are perceived by others. Right. And that goes back to this thing we talked about last time in terms of leader identity development. How are, how are we perceived in the social role as leader by our followers? All right. You ready to move on to the A in yeah, ocean? Yeah, certainly. Let's talk agreeableness, which is the degree to which somebody's willing to work with other folks. Compassion, cooperation, trustworthiness, and being well-tempered are kind of what we would associate with agreeableness. Okay. So people with a high level of agreeableness tend to be more helpful. They tend to go along. Tend to go along. They tend to go along. They tend to, they tend to be agreeable. They tend to get along with people and, and try to get along with people. The problem with agreeableness is if you have too much of it, you're perceived as being gullible or naive, sometimes submissive. If you have low agreeableness, then a lot of times people are suspicious of you. They think you're antagonistic. They think you're competitive or deceitful manipulative or even uncaring. Okay. So it kind of depends on how, you, again, we're back to how you're perceived by your followers in terms of that trait. A person with a high level of agreeableness is going to come across as somebody who, who plays well with others, who likes to collaborate, likes to help. Right. And that's pr what we're probably talking about. Agree a person who's acceptably agreeable is a person who's conscientious, um, is willing to work with others. They have some compassion. Somebody with too much agreeableness is somebody we would associate with being gullible, naive, or submissive. Okay? So it's, remember, it's a golden mean virtue right there in the middle between two behaviors, both at the extreme. Okay. Okay? Well, let's talk about the N in ocean. <laughs> Neuroticism, the one that everybody likes most. Yeah. And, and you'll see a lot of five-factor studies that basically go the other way. Okay? Instead of talking about neuroticism, they'll talk about a person's stability. Okay, neuroticism being uh, one's instability or their tendency to be prone to psychological stress. Okay. So when we talk about neuroticism, that's what we're really talking about. And we're talking about a person who is sensitive and nervous vice a person who's secure and confident. Okay, that's kind of what we're looking at here in terms of neuroticism or the two sides of the coin. Okay, so even keeled versus somebody who's easily upset, easily irritated. Exactly right. Stable and calm versus being excitable and insecure. And you had mentioned that four of these correlate to a, a higher effectiveness in influence and one doesn't. Can I guess then that neuroticism is, is the standalone? Right. Not, neuroticism is the one that has a strong negative correlation. As your neuroticism goes up, your effectiveness goes down. The other four, your openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness, as they go up, your effectiveness tends to go up. Okay. As you score across those five attributes. To a point, though, because you had mentioned, though, like 
for agreeableness. If it's too high, we can appear to be gullible, right, right, lacking a spine. So there's a sweet spot for all of these. Exactly. Exactly uh, right. If you get too much of it, it becomes a negative behavior or it manifests itself in a negative behavior. It's an overdone strength. As an overdone, that's a great way of looking at it. Okay. An overdone strength. The only thing I'd like to point out, James, I want to hit this one more time because I think it's important for people who are listening in. There is no universal agreement as what constitutes effective attributes or positive attributes, positive characteristics, and positive traits. Okay. Okay, I want to make sure that everybody understands that, okay, because there's no agreement as to what those are. What's the universe of positive attributes? There's no agreement. So it's probably best then, again, to use these tools to assist in our own self-awareness and leverage our strengths. How can we polish or refine our strengths and not try to be something that we aren't? Yeah, as a general rule, I think anytime we focus in and, and operate in accordance with our strengths, I think we're much better prepared to lead. I think the worst thing we can do is to try to be something we're not, because then we lack the authenticity that leaders ought to have. All right. Let's talk about uh, competency and behavioral leadership approaches. Okay, that's great. Now, before we talked about attributes or traits or things that are a part of your makeup that make you effective as a, as a leader, here we're talking about the things that you do, the behaviors you engage in, the conduct that you undertake. And that's where we're going to, we're, we're instead of talking about qualities, we're going to talk about how you act or how you conduct yourself. All right. And this assumes that effective leaders have different behaviors than ineffective or non-effective leaders. And the father of the behavioral approach is a guy named Ralph Stogsdill, who did most of his research in the 1940s and 50s, ran numerous management and leadership studies uh, with Michigan Univer University of Michigan and Ohio State University. Now, prior to Stogsdill, almost all discussions about leadership focused on, on attributes and traits. So this is kind of where you pick up in history the competency or behavioral approach to leadership. Okay, so uh, when we talk about behaviors, behaviors are demonstrated primarily through skills and competencies. And when we talk about skills and competencies, we got to know what a skill is and we got to know what a competency is. We talk about a skill. A skill is a practiced and proficient ability to do something well. You got, you got kids who played sports? Uh, not yet. They're too young. You, got, you played sports growing up? Uh, no. No? Uh, <laughs> no? All right, let's use a baseball analogy. Okay. Okay, I was a baseball coach here for about five years. Let me give you the baseball analogy. If we're talking about a skill, a practiced and proficient ability to do something well, we're talking about something very discreet. We would say to a baseball player, you are a skilled hitter. You have the practiced and proficient ability to hit a baseball well. If we wanted to say to them, you're a competent, now a skill plus a skill plus a skill that are interrelated to each other becomes a competency. Now, I know in the Army, we like to use the terms skills and competencies interchangeably, but they're not. They mean different things. So let's work our way up a ladder. We start with a skill, a practiced and proficient ability to do something well. The next level up is a competency, which is an interrelated skill plus a skill plus a skill. So back to our baseball analogy. If I were to say you are a competent offensive baseball player, that means you could hit the ball, you could run the bases, you could bunt, you could steal a base, all those things associated with the offensive portion of the baseball game, we would say you're a competent offensive baseball player. You with me? Amalgamation of skills. That's a great point. It's amalgamation of interrelated skills. Interrelated okay, skills. Okay, interrelated skills, interconnected skills, if you will. And then at the top of, after we get to the competency level, we get to metacompetency. Just like a skill plus a skill plus a skill equals a competency, a competency plus a competency plus a competency equals a metacompetency. Now, once our baseball player can play the outfield, then they can throw, and they know how to pitch, they know how to catch, and they can play the defensive side of baseball, and then we would say they are a metacompetent baseball player. Okay, They have mastered a set of competencies that are all interrelated. Leadership is a metacompetency. Okay. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. When we start talking about competencies and behaviors, we're talking about metacompetencies for leadership. Now, going back to the baseball analogy, I see that it's pertaining to the psychomotor domain. So I can go out there, practice my swing. It's hand-eye coordination. Is there a different requirement for the type of practice that one would get when it's purely cognitive? Or are leadership competencies more than just something purely cognitive. Well, sure. Let's talk about let's talk about perhaps giving a speech. Okay. Okay. There are a set of skills associated with giving a speech. Some practiced and proficient things we have to do well. Perhaps it's writing the outline for the speech. 
All right, and there's a set of companies associated with the speech. Okay, well, I have to do the outline. I've got to be able to articulate in an oral fashion. I've got to be able to compose myself. I've got to make sure that I've covered all of the topics that are there. Okay, so we can you can you can extrapolate it to the artistic domain. We can extrapolate it to the kinesthetic domain. We can extrapolate it to just about any domain. Skills and competencies and meta competencies exist across domains. So if one of our listeners isn't in a leadership position yet, they'd like to be and uh-huh. like to develop position as a leader. Position as a leader. Thank you. <laughs> and they would like to develop some of these competencies. What would you recommend then, as far as um, how one might frame this or how one might develop a plan to develop these competencies as it pertains to leadership? Well, I think the thing you have to do is you have to be aware of what the competencies are. And we're going to talk a little bit about a competency and behavior-based model coming up. Uh, ADRP 622 uh, lays out three competencies, and it says that what leaders must do is to lead, develop, and achieve. Okay, those are the competencies as articulated in ADRP 622. But lead, develop, achieve, those sound ambiguous to me. Those are pretty broad topics. Right, and the next thing we should do is drill down into it and say, okay, what are the skills required for lead? What are the skills required for develop? And what are the skills required for achieve? Great. And that's what we want to get after in terms of our skill development. So I I think it's important for us to understand that 622 doesn't define a competency. It's like an attribute. It's no longer a formally defined term. It's simply what a leader does. Okay, or what what a leader does. We probably ought to say a competency is what a leader does effectively. Right. Because if it's not effectively done, it's not a competency. Now, are you referring specifically to the leadership requirements model, the LRM in ADRP 622? Is that where most of those? You could. Yeah, you certainly could. You can, you can go into 622 and look at the attributes that are in there that are listed and the traits that are associated with those attributes. So you can simply look at the competencies and then begin to drill down into what skills are required to develop those competencies in 622. And FM 622 leader development, that came out about three years after ADRP 622. And that actually has some added attributes and competencies in the leadership requirements model, even though it's supposedly the same thing, it's it's added a few more. And that's a great point. It, it, you know, when 622 came out, it wasn't as definitive probably as it needed to be, but, but FM 622 kind of gives you much more detailed instruction in terms of what skills need to be developed in order to support those competencies. Now, just like we talked about in the attribute theory, when it comes to, to competency or behavior-based approaches, Again, the scholarly leadership community has not come to a definitive answer as to what constitutes the competencies or behaviors you're supposed to portray or be able to do. Again, it kind of leads itself open to some interpretation. So really the point then is do the best you can to know self and from there develop those strengths and the path forward and and be you. Be the best you versus trying to be something you aren't. There, there may be something to seeing a weakness and wanting to, to, to work on that and to, to develop that. Now, remember, we talked about the return on investment when it comes, let's talk for a minute here about the return on investment associated with deficit remediation, vice building our strengths. The return on investment when it comes time for us to reduce a deficit, to deficit fix, to fix a shortfall, okay, is much harder than it is if we develop you in accordance with your natural strengths. Okay, the return on investment is much lower because we're working against what it is you're probably naturally inclined not to do. Right. All right, we want to develop you as a leader in accordance with your naturally imbued strengths. You may not be transformational in nature. And as a result, to try to turn you into a transformational leader is probably going to be met with average performance at best. Okay, you may be a servant leader. And you may be naturally inclined to be a servant leader. And if you are, that's where we should spend our time and effort in developing the skills, the competencies, and the meta competencies associated with being a servant leader. So just for clarity then on your position. So growing up in the 80s, I was told I could be anything I wanted to be. And from what you're saying, that if I... If I only go after my weaknesses, the best I'll ever be is probably average versus if I focus more on my strengths, I can then achieve that above average, at least in those particular behaviors. That's exactly right. You're probably not going to be the lead guitarist of Van Halen if you're not musically inclined. You're probably not going to paint a Picasso unless you're artistically inclined. Those are natural inclinations. If you believe Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, 
that people have different talents in different areas. We probably ought to maximize what your talents are and work around those things that you're not naturally inclined to excel at. Yeah, Rath talks about that too in Rath, Strengths Finders, another book. All right, well, let's talk about the worthy leadership model. Okay, great, because when we talk about, when we talk about uh, behaviors and competency models, the worthy leadership model is probably the best I've come across. So it's developed in 2008 um, by a company called Leadership Worth Following out of Tex- uh, Fort Worth, Texas, uh, originally published in the Consulting Psychology Journal in 2008. And it's, it's important for us before we identify the competencies that the worthy leadership model says we have to have is to define what worthy leadership is. Worthy leadership, as they define it, is the ability to guide, direct, or influence people. There's that term influence again. In a way that has great merit, or great merit, character, or value. It's a little higher calling towards influence behavior as opposed to this is just what leadership is influence. So that's why the term worthy is part of their model. And it really articulates three overarching competencies, the capacity to lead, the commitment to lead, and the character to lead. That sounds like the three words we heard earlier from ADRP 622. Well, think about ADRP 1. Now, we're going to come back to ADRP 1 here in a minute because I think it's foundational to us as to where ADRP 1 draws its inspiration from. So this is published in 2008. Uh, It lists the capacity to lead as the competency comprised of aptitudes and skills related to what a leader can do. And it talks about the capacity to reason and make good decisions and see into the future, communicate, speak influentially, to know, which is intellect, and to persevere and adapt. That's what the capacity to lead, the capacity competency is comprised of. So there we start to see the skills identified underneath the competency itself. The commitment competency is what a leader is willing to do. How much effort are they willing to put forth? Are they committed to excellence? Are they committed to people? Are they committed to learning and personal growth? Are they committed to the stakeholders of the organization? Okay, what it is they're willing to do. It's a great story on on, uh, Bobby Knight. I saw an interview with Bobby Knight, and he said at one point when it came time for him to retire, he knew he had the capacity to still coach, and character was never an issue with him. He said he had lost his willingness, his commitment to what it was he was going to do in terms of leading the program. He wasn't willing to put forth the effort anymore. So commitment's in there. And then finally, character is the last competency, and it focuses on what leaders will do. And here we're talking about personal integrity and ethics, organizational integrity and courage, and humility, openness, gratitude, and forgiveness as making up the character competency of the worthy leadership model. So here we see the skills that we identify under the competencies, and we add the three C's together, we get a meta competency. So those three C's, uh, capacity, commitment, and character. Going back to ADRP1, the profession, it mentions um, character, competence, and commitment, which is uh, the trust is earned through character, competence, and commitment. It's just interesting, um, the similarities there, the parallels. And so this, these are the three C's that make up worthy leadership in accordance with the, with the worthy leadership model, where we use it as how trust is earned. Or what the Army professional is supposed to demonstrate. Right. Okay, the, the implication here is the Army professional at any time, and we've, heard the, we've, all, we've all heard the saying that we're all leaders. And so as part of being an Army professional, we're expected to demonstrate the character, competency, and commitment associated with being a professional. I don't think it's serendipitous, and I don't think it's a, uh, I think there's a, there's a conscious effort there to link the Army professional and the definition with the competencies that are required to be a worthy leader. And uh, what year did ADRP1 come out? 2015 is when it was written. So it was written seven years after the worthy leadership model was produced. And I believe the author of ADRP1 had probably done their homework and looked at what the the competencies associated with leadership, worthy leadership were. Any other points you'd like to cover uh, before we wrap this up? No, I think we just we want to rehash just a little bit to make sure we that, that we think laissez-faire is probably not an effectual mode of influence, probably not an effectual influence approach for a leader. Okay, I think that what we want to do when we talk about traits and attributes is we talk about the characteristics associated with someone. Right. And then we talk about behaviors 
It's the conduct or the actions that the leader is going to engage in. And those are the three approaches that we discussed today. And again, if there's one common theme to this, there's no one way. Each person needs to find their way with, through developing self-awareness, through either feedback or uh, their own experiences, and truly wanting to know, yeah, to, to leverage those strengths. And you can become something that you aren't predisposed to be. But you're not going to be very good at it. Or, or at least an average yeah, performer. There's going to be some limit. Okay, an average performer. And I think you make a great point. The principle of the principle of equifinality continues to apply. Mm -hmm. There are multiple ways to be an effectual leader. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And then there's the Peter principle too. Have you heard of the Peter principle? Oh, certainly, certainly. Peter principle that people get promoted up to their level of incompetence. <laughs> I I do. I think there's there may be some of that. I think we all run out of competence at some point. Uh, the question is, where is it? All right. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> all right. And we welcome your feedback. Please write us at usarmy.lovenworth.tradoc.mbx.amsc-podcast at mail.mail. Or you can just write us at amscpodcast at gmail.com.